is uh, Lars Hörlein. I currently work as an IT security specialist at Nexus Cybersecurity, but I have a background uh, with the soft embedded software development. I studied uh, in Uppsala uh, engineering physics with a major in embedded systems. And I, I really love measurements. So this is uh, sort of uh, the intersection between security and measurements. Uh, I, I th is it? Uh, but I don't think there are any loudspeakers here. Uh, it's only for the video recording. Mm. <laughs> yes, um, embedded systems. Uh, and I also enjoy uh, um, playing CTFs with my team hacking for Sergio. So the outline for today is uh, first I will introduce side channel attacks. And then I will uh, go down into depth on two of them, uh, timing attacks and uh, uh, power consumption al analysis on the AES encryption algorithms. And then uh, we will have this, uh, a workshop, um, and I will uh, go through and give some instructions on that. But um, first things first, what is a side channel attack? And uh, Wikipedia says it's best. Uh, it is an attack that is not based on uh, uh, weaknesses in algorithms or implementations, but rather the implementation uh, itself. Uh, that the, an implementation of a program can leak uh, information through things as execution time or power consumption, which we will talk about today. Uh, but there are also other ways, uh, sound or uh, electromagnetic radiation or a few. And uh, these attacks uh, re often require that you have physical access uh, to the d a device, which makes them a bit hard. If you use the, the CVSS uh, scoring system, uh, y you will see that these attacks uh, are categorized as you require physical access, um, which means that they are harder to exploit. You cannot exploit them from anywhere on the internet, but you need to have the device uh, in your hands. But the information that you can get is uh, often considered confidential. Uh, so uh, they get severe from that. Um, so the uh, the equipment that you need to uh, capture um, to to um, exploit side channel attacks are, are usually measurement equipment that can uh, capture very weak signals, because these are not signals uh, that uh, the system is supposed to emit. So they are often very weak. But you can use logic analyzers to capture digital signals and measure the timings, or you can use a digital oscilloscope to get uh, power consumption measurements. There are also some mixed signal oscilloscopes, do both digital and uh, uh, analog. But uh, the hardest part often when you do this is every instrument is different. So you need to uh, find out how, how do I interface with this uh, USB device um, or this oscilloscope. Uh, but uh, there are many uh, different vendors and they use their own communication protocols. But. Uh, that is the introduction. I was thinking of having a, a question session on, on the end of each uh, section. So this is the introduction to, to side channels. Are there any questions so far? Yeah? Couldn't timing attacks be applied over the internet? Yes, uh, but these are, are on the embedded systems. Uh, but it's, I will show some uh, examples there as well. But you are ext uh, you're right on that one. Okay. No? Oh yes, uh, so the question was uh, if uh, uh, timing attacks does not apply on, uh, uh, over the internet as well. And, and yes, they do. But uh, we will see that I in our examples here that uh, when you actually have uh, your hands on a device, things that you thought were timing safe are not. Yeah, I don't know, uh, do, you, do you see a new secure hardware actually working to, to prevent this? I mean, for the, there are uh, some uh, secure ships uh, coming, yes, but some of these uh, needs to be addressed on the on the like, on the software level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know if uh, CVSS scores side channels on embedded systems uh, identical to side channels, say, co-located in a cloud environment? Uh, so the question was if uh, CVSS scoring is the same on embedded devices or uh, 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 and on the web and. To some degree, yes. Yeah, if you look at the CVSs, it says uh, 
you can affect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And some uh, embedded devices are also connected to the internet, so even network uh, attack vectors apply. Uh, so yes, the same scoring, but you always need to when you do a risk analysis, you, you need to make sure you, you need to weigh everything together. Now, then, then we will continue to uh, and, and looking on uh, on timing attacks. And uh, again, Wikipedia says it best: um, a timing attack um, is. Uh, a side channel where we exploit the fact that uh, different um, a, a program can take different uh, time to uh, execute depending on what input data it gets. Uh, so, and and uh, this gets very, um, it, usually this might not be a, a problem, but when you can do very exact measurements, this can be an issue. We'll have a look at the sample uh, of uh, some uh, vulnerable code here. So this uh, was, I was just looking for a password uh, check function for, uh, for the Arduino. And this was the first one I found. And it actually has a vulnerability in it. This is the uh, evaluate password uh, function. And it looks like this. So it, it loops through uh, uh, all the uh, uh, characters. Uh, and if um, you reach the end, okay, maybe here, if you reach the end, uh, and you bo both are uh, string terminators, then you return true. Otherwise, if, if the characters are different, uh, or if you reach one uh, uh, string terminator before the others, then you return false. So is this safe or not? What is the... What is... No. Which line? Have you read my slides? <laughs> uh, there's a dangerous early return here on the line 21. So the algorithm terminates uh, as soon as it r reaches two different characters. Uh, so I have made a measurement example. Um, again, not, not, uh, not on this library code, but I wrote some of my own. So uh, I wrote a small example which just uh, sends uh, out enter password um, on the serial port and then asks for a password, and then does a, comparison to, a string comparison to a super secret password. And then it says uh, wrong if it's not the same and else is, if it's correct. So if this was a normal C program, this would be, uh, except that you have plain text passwords, it wouldn't be really be any security issues with this. Uh, but when you're looking at uh, it from a side channel perspective, then you, uh, you get new perspectives. So if we look at what this looks like, if we do a measurement. So this is, um, this is a, a measurement uh, I did earlier, uh, where I was running this program on a small microcontroller and was listening to the traffic that was going to it. So this is the, the input now. Oh. This is the input coming here on, uh, as a serial bits. And here are, they are uh, parsed as bytes. So we send test, new line and we get a reply wrong, uh, almost immediately. Uh, but if we send a super secret password and then a new lane, then we get correct. But we, we, we should look uh, at these again. We, we get a reply, but if we zoom in here on where we actually get the reply, you can see that when we, when the, uh, we have a, a wrong password, then the timing here uh, between that we send the last character and we get the reply, it's shorter than when uh, we have a, a correct password. Because for the correct password, we need to check every byte before we can say this is wrong. So um, what does this mean? If we, this, is, this is just a graph, so we, we, we don't have any numbers to compare. But we, if we actually look at the numbers here, if we send, let's say, three big A's, and then we can see that it's and measure the time, we can see that it uh, takes 24 microseconds um, to get a negative reply. If we send BBBBB, we get 24.53 microseconds, so it's almost the same. Uh, but if we send uh, a big S, then we get 25. So we get a longer uh, response time when we have the first uh, character correct. So now we know the first character, and we can go on and try the next character. So we can try uh, SSSS, and we get uh, 25. If you type S uh, little u, we get 25.93, so it's longer. 
and you can automate this process, but uh, in the end when you try the whole password, then the response time is almost 40 microseconds. So it's uh, 15 microseconds longer than the first one. So what does this mean? With this timing attack, we can check one byte at a time. So we lower the brute force complexity, complexity enormously. So if you like complexity measurements, then we go from having uh, exponential complexity to uh, something that is linear in both the number of characters and the, the, the length. So if we have an 8 byte password uh, with all the printable characters, which is pretty strong, uh, and can try one of these every second, then we, we can do it in uh, 13 minutes. But if we would have been trying everything, it would be 230 million years. So it uh, makes it a lot faster to um, actually um, brute force. But there are mitigations to this. You can use constant time checking algorithms. I missed an and here. Uh, um, so uh, what this function does, it goes through I the strings uh, a and b with a length, and it checks every byte. And, if they, uh, and then it computes the value, are they equal or not? And then it says, uh, and it with these are equal. So if this any time during the execution, this is false, then the all or equals will be set to false, and the return value will be false. But you should not trust your compiler here. And uh, that is important, because if you have a really optimizing compiler, it might realize that, oh, but you will just return false, so I can terminate early. So optimization might sometimes break uh, even safe implementations. So, uh, and also, you, you could, if you do something like this, that you have an if clause, uh, and check if they're equal, and you, you do an extra operation, then this will not have constant time, because Every time they are not equal, it will take a little bit longer. So, uh, but this is, uh, I was trying, this is compiler dependent. Uh, so, uh, um, now for some assembly code. I was running the exact same uh, program, compile it with uh, no um, optimization at all. And it goes down here and it checks if the bytes are equal. And if they are, if they are not equal, then it will set this variable r equals to zero. Otherwise, it will jump over that instruction and uh, continue the loop. But if we do a, an optimized, uh, uh, fully optimized version, it will use the, the special instruction conditional move. And it will uh, execute the same number of instructions all the time. So uh, um, it will be compiler flag dependent even for the same piece of code. So you need to be careful to, when you assess that the, the code does not have any timing attack for that like this. This was the timing attack session. Are there any questions so far? Yes? Is there any reason to not use hash code, uh, hashing these strings? Well, you could also, uh, no, no, this is just uh, an example uh, of timing attacks. So if you have an algorithm uh, that uh, terminates early, that might leak information about the system. String compare is uh, not use, often seen as vulnerable, but it is vulnerable to um, timing attacks. So if you somehow leak information. Let's say that you would have um, some kind of command interface, and you could then enumerate all the commands uh, in this because it probably does a string comparison to uh, every command. And you could uh, try to f uh, map uh, out maybe some un undocumented commands in the system. You had another question? Uh, for the constant time implementation, what if the input doesn't have the same length as the password? Um, yes, so the question was about uh, this, uh, this Im implementation. Uh, if if the, the length are, are not equal, um, yes, that might be an issue, but <laughs> Yeah, you have to make sure that you allocate e enough memory here so you don't get any memory errors. Uh, and even if they were not... Uh, mm, this is sort of like the, the mem compare function, actually. Uh, the mem compare... Uh, if, the, if you have a mem compare function that does not terminate early, it's a bit similar because it doesn't use any null termination here. Was that an answer to your question? Yeah, I think so. Oh, thank you. Uh, any other questions on timing attacks?
Oh, I didn't draw this. This is a screenshot from uh, the IDA free decompiler. Mm. So it's a reverse engineering tool that you can use to look inside binaries to see uh, how the, the code has been compiled. Yes? Yeah, uh, just to be clear, like in many cases, optimization will introduce a vulnerability. But in this particular case, the optimization actually removes the vulnerability. Uh, uh, optimization will affect uh, the uh, the timing uh, mm -hmm. of the the program, so you need to be be careful um, if this is uh, in, in your uh, um, in your scope of your uh, evaluating your risks in your system. Uh, yes. I yes. I think that even with the same number of instructions, instructions can take different amounts of time and yeah. different inputs from what uh, I heard. Yeah, so, so kind of a list of constant time instructions mm. that people have measured, and it's not official, and so mm. it's not said anything about Yeah, so, so the, the question was that uh, um, instructions can take different times to execute, and yes, they can. And it will, you can also have uh, different things like uh, cache uh, timing attacks. But th that is so, sort of out, out of the scope for this introductional presentation. Uh, are there any? No. Yes, one question? I don't think it would act, uh, so the question was uh, I I what happens if we get an interrupt during this code execution and it would not, uh, uh, I think it wouldn't affect the confidentiality of the data that you're comparing and that is what is in scope here. Can we somehow give input data to leak out what it is compared to and uh, interrupts uh, that would trigger during the code execution would only yeah, add noise to the measurement, basically. So no uh, uh, impacts on confidentiality. I will go on to uh, the next section, which is about power analysis attacks. And uh, again, Wikipedia it says that uh, power analysis, uh, you look at uh, how much uh, power uh, a cryptographic device consumes and then use that information to derive uh, internal secrets. So uh, what is it in a microcontroller that is data dependent that consumes power? It is the actual bit lines in the, uh, in the processor. So every bit you have on your, on your data line uh, will uh, somehow consume power. So uh, this is a, <coughs> a, a simple ALU, uh, a thing that uh, makes uh, logical operations inside um, processor. So all these lines uh, that, that hold bits, uh, because uh, in microprocessors bits are, are uh, electron flows, they will need, will need to be uh, filled with a uh, uh, current and this current is consumed and it can be measured. So how much the, does a byte consume? It consumes, uh, uh, we, we can make an assumption that the power consumption of a byte uh, it's proportional to the number of set bits. And what we use then is, the, is an operator called the Hamming weight of a byte, which is it count how many one bits we have. So for uh, zero, we have uh, zero bits. And for five, we have uh, two bits. And for uh, one F, we have uh, five bits. But so this does not correlate uh, anything with the actual value of the byte, because even a big number like 128 hex 80 is, uh, uh, has only one bit set. And uh, of course, if we go on our theme of this meetup, uh, we can see that uh, this is the highest byte. So it has a Hamming weight of eight, eight set bits. Um, so we, we will come to back to how we, we can use this uh, as a side channel attack. Uh, but we will also look at, uh, when you actually measure power consumption, uh, you, you need to make sure that um, you know how, how to measure it. There is a really good paper on this uh, uh, by uh, Zivlinas Nakotis, uh, which describes different methods uh, that you can use. The, the most common way is to uh, put a resistor in the series with your uh, device. And then uh, if there is, goes uh, a higher current through the system, the voltage drop over this resistor will increase. And this voltage can be measured with uh, an oscilloscope. And this will uh, 
sh uh, give you a, uh, the, the current consumption of the system. But it is also important to uh, uh, measure as close as possible uh, because it, uh, this is uh, an illustration of uh, what uh, the current uh, consumption would look like on the different points in this. This is the uh, uh, current consumer. And um, if you me me measure here, uh, the real uh, power consumption here is a really high and narrow peak. But once you get away from it, uh, then the, uh, the power consumption gets a bit smothered out. Um, and um, uh, when you measure it uh, all the way on the power delivery rail, then it might be a, a really wide and long peak. You could see this as to measure the shape of the road while you're in your uh, car with suspensors because the actual shape of the road will not get transferred uh, unmodified through all the suspensors. Uh, you could lock your suspensors, but then you would not get a very comfortable ride. And you can also, uh, also desolder these capacitors in the same way. That would make uh, the uh, power signal yeah, less uh, uh, out. But it can also damage the system because it can get, uh, uh, it expects them to be here, like dampening. So, a, co uh, a common example when you do a power analysis like this is the AES algorithm. So, it is a crypto algorithm, it's a, it's a symmetric block cipher. Uh, so, symmetric it uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt data. And this is often what makes it interesting in uh, uh, leaking out the key in embedded systems because the key is inside the device and uh, an attacker would uh, often want to uh, get it out to use. It works on blocks with uh, 16 bytes and uh, yeah, the key should be secret. And I will refer to AES 128 when I say AES in this uh, presentation. There are other variations but this is the most simple one. So the algorithm itself, uh, this is what it looks like written in pseudocode. Um, so it, 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 what it, it has uh, basically four different steps. Uh, one is it takes this block with 16 bytes and then it uh, XORs it with a key. That is one step. This is uh, what uh, adds uh, secrets to them. And it's invertible because you can just XOR with the same key back. Then there is a uh, nonlinear um, substitution box which, which uh, introduces nonlinearity, so it takes every byte and then maps it uh, to another byte. And this is also in, in, uh, designed to be invertible. Next thing is it uh, moves the bytes around. And uh, this is also uh, invertible, you can just move them back. Uh, and then you uh, mix, uh, uh, you add the sum of the bytes, uh, bytes together with each other, and you can invert that as well by uh, um, yeah, adding them back or subtracting them, uh, and then uh, you XOR with the key again, and then you run this for nine times. Uh, and th then uh, these all together will ensure that the bytes get nonlinearly transformed, and then that these, uh, the key uh, affects all uh, the block, and uh, that uh, every input byte affects all output bytes. But one thing that is interesting uh, in, in for the differential power analysis attack is up until that we mix the columns and add uh, uh, different bytes together, uh, there is only one, one input byte will affect one and only one byte in the block. So um, uh, doing a one byte substitution, exiting with the key and just swapping bytes around, nothing of this will mix the bytes together. So. Um, up until uh, this, uh, we can see it as a one byte block cipher. But we'll c we come back to that as well. Hamming weights and uh, the one byte block cipher. If you look at this, uh, the power consumption now of these nine rounds in an oscilloscope, it will look like this. Uh, so um, this is a screenshot from an oscilloscope. What we have here on the y axis is the actual mo uh, power consumption uh, over time. So time increases over there. So first it goes a bit like this, and then it starts, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rounds, and then it ends. So this is one block of the AES encryption. And regarding this, uh, this step here, when we come out from the uh, S box, 
we can look, if we look at the power consumption right there and zoom in, and we do it for a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, captured traces with the same key, uh, it will look like this. So it is sort of the same, and then it, it, they will be different. We have different power consumption, and this power consumption will be dependent on the data. Because we have this sort of one byte block cipher. We have in data, it will be XOR with the key, and then going through the substitution box. We know this input byte, and there are only 256 possibilities for the byte. So if we can somehow get the information about the system here, we can, um, we can uh, sort of uh, try to see what is the key byte that has uh, encrypted this in data byte. So now for the most important slide in this presentation, uh, it is a lot of text, but I, uh, I want to go through this clearly. So if we know one input byte, and we can measure the power consumption after this uh, substitution box, then we can go through all the 256 possible key values and compute what value we would have uh, here. So here we have an in data, we XOR it with the key, put it through the S box. We can do this for all 250, it's only 256 possi possibilities. So we can do all of them. When we get this data value, we can compute its Hamming weight, uh, the number of set bits. And then we can compare this to the actual power consumption that we measure at this point. And for all these 256 possibilities, the one with the, the, that matches the best is probably the correct key byte for uh, this, uh, uh, that the encryption algorithm is using. So what does this look like? Uh, here I plotted the, the correlation for one, of, uh, one byte that was wrong. So this was, uh, I guess, key byte 91. And here I guess uh, key byte 92. And here we have the number of set bits and the uh, power consumption at that point. So we can see that for the wrong key, we get a sort of a round blob. But when we have the correct key, it, it will get, we get this trend that it is increasing to this uh, uh, when we have a lot of bit sets and it's decreasing when we have fewer bit sets. It is not perfect. Uh, this is not a straight line, but there is a trend here. And you, it, uh, you can illustrate this, but uh, if you have ever done a linear regression, you might have uh, come across the linear uh, regression co coefficient, which measures how well does this, uh, does, would a line explain this? So in this case, uh, this uh, coefficient is 0 by 0 0.2, which means that there is basically, they are not dependent at all. But for uh, this key byte 92, we get the correlation of 0 0.42. And that means that there is uh, somehow a relationship between these two variables. So we can plot this now. But there, there is a, uh, still a lot of combinations. We have uh, 16 bytes in the block. So we need to do this for every byte to get all the key bytes. There are, for every key byte, there are 256 possible keys. And uh, there is also uh, a lot of uh, traces, uh, which uh, we, uh, lots of positions where you could be. Uh, this correlation was in a specific place only. So you need to do this for all, the, uh, uh, all times. And the, there are typically several hundred traces that you have captured to do this kind of measurements. Uh, but when you plot this in the end, it looks something like this. Here we still have the, uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this is four and times four, uh, when it goes through all the uh, substitution bytes. And we can see that for this uh, one uh, byte, we have one thing. That, oh, here is a pattern at this very location. So what we're plotting here is uh, the correlation. How well does this correlate? And we can see that this is sort of a noise level. And this, at this point here, we go above them. So what this tells us is that at this point here in time, um, we, the, the power consumption correlates uh, with the output uh, from uh, the uh, uh, S-box number 8. So we, we can uh, determine that if we have uh, uh, the key 90, what's it, 92? Yeah, 192. 
But uh, if we try another input box, we can see that this position moves. So here's, here is uh, for the box zero. So this is this on another place in time. So this is when uh, other instructions uh, execute. So you need to do, uh, to create this uh, correlation cloud, you need to uh, collect a, a, a lot uh, of traces. Uh, because only having two, uh, it is very easy to draw a straight line between two points and say that they fit perfectly. But to actually uh, say that, oh, is there really a pattern here? You need to collect a lot. So um, when you plot this over time, it looks like this. It starts out at one because, yeah, it, this looks like uh, it, it could be something. But then over time, it decays and says, nah. Except for this one true uh, uh, candidate. And uh, when you come to something like here, you could probably stop taking traces. So it's always a question of how much uh, measurements do we need. And as long as you get more traces, you reduce the, the noise level and you get the signals. So, but there is still uh, some challenges to do with this kind of attack. You need to get your hands on a device. You need to set up uh, a measurement. You need to... Uh, uh, collect a lot of measurement data, both the power consumption and the corresponding input data to that uh, function. You also need to align the traces because you, if you measure once uh, and then again, you need to make sure that the same, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the outputs, uh, that they line up together uh, algorithm-wise. There is always noise and uh, you should do the, uh, this kind of correlation computations. So um, which, when you do a, a capture these, there, there are software to do this uh, computation, so you don't need to do it manually or drawing them in a plot. But uh, there are a few data formats. Uh, most commonly are the TRS and uh, yeah, it's not just NumPy data files, which consist uh, of two lists uh, where uh, you have the, uh, the input data bytes and the, the power measurements uh, that co uh, correspond to that. You, can also, you, you don't need to use the input data, but you can also use the output data uh, of, um, uh, of the encryption algorithm. So uh, in this case, uh, you would not uh, provide any input data, but you would uh, lo look at the output instead, um, extract the key, and then try to uh, look at the point just before the end of the encryption. This is done in almost the same way, but you need to make sure that you don't go this way through the S-Box, but you go that way. So you need to use the inverse S-Box. So mitigations to this, um, yeah, there are a few. There are certain implementations of AES to, uh, that uses um, not the standard uh, S-Boxes, but uh, they use something called masking to distribute the uh, the, uh, um, the, the power consumption, so you cannot predict it uh, as easily. Uh, and the others induce noise, or so make sure that uh, only uh, some parts of the algorithm are executed, or it uh, changes the order. Uh, but the best way um, to mitigate uh, um, not, uh, is to not have any secrets uh, in your device at all, because uh, then there is nothing to leak out, nothing is secret. Um, a colleague of mine uh, actually had a talk about this um, on HealthSec, which is uh, a similar thing as uh, OXFF, but in Helsinki, uh, now uh, earlier this year. So if you're interested, you can look that up. Uh, also, th there are uh, some advices in the uh, OWASP application security verification standard uh, regarding Internet of Things that only use microcontrollers that provide substantial protection for decapping and side-channel attacks, uh, which means that you sh they shouldn't be easy to take apart or that they should not leak signals or that they should have a... Um, um, that they should be safe, safer against these kinds of attacks. So. If you want to learn more about uh, differential power analysis, you, uh, there are some uh, learning materials on the internet. I found out about this just yesterday when I was uh, doing the last uh, reference uh, slides to this uh, uh, presentation. So uh, this is a collection of uh, lab exercises. 
sort of uh, that will um, uh, go through uh, the steps uh, uh, to these kinds of uh, uh, attacks and what aspects they have. There is also um, a CTF uh, security competition called uh, from the uh, uh, company called Rischer in the Netherlands. Um, they have released uh, their old challenge, uh, which you, you only need an Arduino Nano to run the, this on, for you, on your own. So you, you can uh, try different timing related or differential power analysis related attacks. This was uh, uh, the power analysis part. Uh, and the, uh, so the next, uh, next uh, I was uh, going to talk about the workshop. I think we're about uh, 40 minutes in. Or, so I, I was thinking, I, I will present the workshop before we do uh, uh, go for uh, having some sandwiches. But are there any questions on the differential power analysis so far? Yes? Uh, can you go back to how you measure the power consumption of the whole thing? Yes. I think that was the circuit. <coughs> yes, here. Right. So, uh, so how do you measure the power consumption? Oh, uh, yes. So what you do, um, so the question was, how do you measure power consumption? So what you want to measure, well, uh, yeah, you can see as you, you measure power consumption or do you measure current consumption? Because they are sort of the same. Uh, but it, if you have uh, the same um, supply voltage, then they will be almost equivalent. So what you do is that the... Um, the current uh, will flow through the circuit or, or the embedded system. And what you do is you put a, a small uh, resistor uh, before uh, the current can reach the system. And then when the, the current gets large, then there will be a voltage over this uh, resistor because when it, the current increases, then the voltage over the resistor will increase. And what you do is you measure this uh, voltage here. Yes, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the question was about uh, introduced noise. Yes, these uh, measurements uh, can be very, very noisy. Um, but uh, are, you, are you asking about deliberate introduction of noise? Yeah, exactly. Um, For purpose. Yes, I think that was... Uh, um, yeah, the first thing in mitigations. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can induce noise. Either uh, you can either use uh, something that uh, com takes more uh, current, so introducing um, current consumption noise, or you can make it, uh, it take deliberately longer to uh, scale it in, in the time domain. That is also a possibility. So that, that's good figure function you'll see in the more secure chips that they will have that randomized power consumption, for instance. But, but related question, uh, I mean, when you that looks like a 60 megahertz or something like that. I would assume, when mm. you're talking really high speed chips, that it would be really, really difficult to find equipment that could measure that without having almost noise. The yes, this, uh, as, you, as you say, this gets a, l a lot harder at, at higher clock frequencies. But it also, um, you, you, sometimes you don't need that to be that exact in your, uh, um, if you look at the, the uh, uh, if you look at this point here, yes, it, it consumes more uh, energy here, but these overlap, the, these uh, two uh, points here. So the, the, uh, be, because of uh, the capacity, uh, capacitance in, in, in the system, so the consumption peaks are smoothed out a bit. And if you capture enough measurements uh, on um, high, uh, high speed systems, you, you will get a signal there as well, but it will take, it, it will take more traces. But yes, the, the usual you target. Measure a lot of other noise. Right? Yes, so uh, <laughs> you, you will need, uh, basically, the noisier the system is, the more measurements you need to see some kind of uh, correlation. There are also, uh, 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 now in, in, during this presentation, I've mentioned correlation based attacks. 
uh, which uses uh, uh, correlation between uh, um, the number of set bits and uh, the actual power consumption. There are newer, this, has, uh, this is an almost 20 year old technology. So there have been a lot of research both on attacks and defenses against this, but this is uh, meant to be an introductionary to, to, to the topic. But yes, there are, uh, are more uh, sophisticated uh, attacks as well that use basis functions and uh, all kind of uh, advanced uh, uh, statistics to uh, treat the data. Hmm? This is on their assumption Did you have a question? Yeah. 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 This is on their assumption that no other processes are running. Yes, uh, this assumes that no other processes uh, are running. Uh, but this is also a, an embedded single core system, so there is no... Uh, so assuming by running with, with one thread, I do small things... Yeah, the, yeah the, this, uh, this system does not have... A, this is a single core system that was, it was measured on. Mm. Yes? So the question was uh, differences between hardware implementations and software implementations, and I would I would say I, I actually don't know. I have only done the software, uh, uh, but uh, there are a, a hardware implementations as well. I don't I don't know really what they. So okay. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Question? Um, what was the hardware uh, you were running? I mean, the, the target hardware. Oh, uh, for, uh, for this, um, um, this uh, capture, uh, uh, these uh, captures are from uh, the uh, Midas Sun CTF qualifiers this spring. And uh, they were, I had first thought to have them on an uh, STM32 ship, but it turned out to be too noisy. So this is on a barebone MSP 430 16-bit uh, uh, microcontroller. But uh, I can use this as a segue to uh, the workshop. Um, so the, uh, for the workshop, uh, uh, when I saw that there were over 50 attendees, uh, I gave up on the idea to give you all some hardware to look at on yourself. So um, that, uh, but uh, I, I had a backup plan uh, because uh, this spring, uh, me and my um, a few uh, companies and uh, were um, and our, our our CTF team were organizing a, a CTF called the Midasan CTF, which had a qualifying round online and finals on site in Stockholm. And our plan was to have a, a kind of measure yourself um, a challenge on. The, on site in Stockholm, but we wanted to introduce this concept to the teams online uh, first. So what we did then was we, uh, I was the, the, the I designed this uh, measurement uh, differential power analysis uh, challenge uh, with the ultimate design goal that you could experience uh, how a DPA attack is performed as close as possible, but without having access to uh, real hardware. So uh, the, uh, the limits then that you must not have any interaction with the system uh, and, you, but, and you cannot do the measurements yourself, but uh, I wanted to provide this. So uh, to uh, do this, uh, I used this uh, concept uh, that we talked about earlier that you can use the uh, output of the encryption. So what I did was uh, I wrote a small program that had uh, plain text inside it, which it's encrypted and uh, printed out. And then uh, I set up a, a measurement rig that, uh, con um, yeah, that uh, connect, uh, collected uh, the, the power traces and uh, uh, the, uh, the output data. And then uh, the teams were supposed to uh, uh, implement uh, the AS uh, uh, attack on the output data on the last S-box uh, in this encryption. There were only three teams that sold this uh, during the 24 hours, so uh, I was not going to give you the challenge uh, yeah, as, uh, as it was there, but you will, uh, I will give you a, a, a smear. I will divide it into uh, three steps. First, uh, I will uh, look about how can you actually get uh, the tools, uh, what, what can you use to solve this challenge. 
so you don't have to guess or read up. And then this tool chain, uh, you, uh, by default, uses input data. So you need to modify it to work with output data. And then, uh, you will, uh, if, you're, uh, if you manage to do that, I will uh, let you have a go on the real challenge. So uh, if we look at what the challenge, this is a, a sort of shortened down the version of the code. It was a small loop, uh, some synchronization. It initializes the uh, AES encryption, prints out, here is your message goes through uh, all the pieces of the secret message, uh, encrypts it with um, AES in CBC mode, and, uh, and prints it out. So uh, what you need to do, what this looks like uh, in, is like this. This is a zoomed out uh, version of the, the um, capture I showed you earlier. Here you have the AES encryption of uh, nine rounds, and here is the printed out data, and you get this printed out data here on the serial uh, uh, port. And then comes the, the next uh, um, uh, encryption and the, the data. So what you need is to um, capture this uh, uh, power consumption here and uh, bind it together with this uh, data here, and then uh, feed it to uh, an analysis program to uh, get the key. And uh, to be uh, sort of format agnostic to the teams, this uh, data here, the uh, uh, measurements uh, signal here, the uh, digital uh, sync signal and the digital um, uh, signal here was given as uh, comma separated values because that is very portable. So, but this is the third step of the, the challenge. So if, if you get there, you will have a, a closer look. So it, it is... Um, millions of lines uh, with the timestamp and the actual uh, current consumption at that moment and then uh, the two digital channels. So uh, for, for this uh, workshop I recommend you to use uh, the, um, the Pi SCA um, uh, tool. It is available on GitHub. Uh, it is open source in Python which uh, is a sort of uh, an uh, accessible language. There are others like JLCA, which uses Yulia, which is a bit more obscure, but it, it has a, bit, a better throughput if you want to go further on that later. There are also some other tools that have uh, GUIs, but uh, I, I would like to stress that it's good if you actually understand what this is about. And then uh, have, uh, the PySCA framework is modifiable and you can uh, do uh, visualizations and plots, and it includes test data to uh, see that it works. So now it's time for the last slide, uh, the workshop instructions. Uh, so uh, the ultimate goal is to solve this uh, challenge uh, uh, that uh, was uh, distributed for the Midnight Sun qualifiers. So the first step is to uh, get the tool chain to work. It's available here. But make, uh, it contains some uh, large files, uh, so you need to make sure that you have git uh, large file storage installed. Um, the next step is to try to uh, make sure that you have all the dependencies. Uh, I, uh, I had it previously installed, so I don't know if some of the dependencies need to be installed. But please let me know. Uh, and the, there, this, uh, there's a default script called attack AES box and CPI visual demo. Uh, they do uh, exactly this what I've, they do with this correlation attack and they make some nice plots. But they do these plots live while they are uh, doing all the computations. So the computation takes quite a long time. So I think you have a 50 time speed up if you strip that away. So from, from a minute down to just a second or so. So uh, something, if you think it's slow, um, you, you can try to uh, strip out everything that uh, has uh, named all LRA, which is another method. But uh, CPA is fine, uh, which is this correlation that you're looking at uh, that I showed in the scatter plot earlier. Next step is to modify the tool chain to handle output from the encryption. And I have provided uh, a trace file here. Uh, but it is uh, the same as the official challenge, but I have, there is only one uh, data byte in it. So you cannot use it uh, to, um, you cannot use this uh, to, to solve the real challenge. 
um, but you can test that your modified uh, uh, working environment is actually working. So this is the second step. And if, if anyone gets here, I'm very happy and I would like to speak more to you. Uh, and and the, if you manage to solve the real challenge, uh, I would uh, be, yeah, I would be really, uh, I would really like to know if you if you do that because. I, but that, that was everything, uh, and I uh, um, come come and speak with me later if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you.